I'm going to read what ended up being an article I saw on another web page. I saw it today. Today being, what is it? It's June 3rd, 2022 is when this is recorded. Briefly going to read an article in part that was given with regard to the duties of husbands and wives, specifically the issue to wives, since that is the subject of this particular conference or lecture by a man named Richard Steele, who's a Puritan, lived between 1672 and 1729. This is what he said. This is the wife's special qualification. If she has all beauty and learning, but no respect for her husband, she is not a good wife. Creation suggests it. She was made after the man, 1 Timothy 2.13, from the man, 1 Corinthians 8.11.8, 8, and for the man, 11.9. This order was not by man's doing, but by God's. Even after the fall, the divine order stands. He shall rule over you, Genesis 3.16. The New Testament confirms all this in Colossians 3 and 1 Peter 3. Even if she's the sweetest thing and her husband the meanest, she still has a duty to respect him. First, she must fix in her heart that her position is inferior to his, and then she will be able to fulfill all respect implies with ease and delight. It is not fitting to set the rib above or even on the same level with the head. Now please note, her position is inferior to his with regard to authority and headship, not with regard to worth. Both men and women made in the image of God. When the old Puritans talked about his superiors and inferiors, they were speaking of positional situations of authority issues. Even today, we talk about um, if you're at work, you have superiors, or you have a superior officer in the military. Think of it in terms like that. A sergeant is by no means inferior to a captain in worth, but he is inferior to his position and authority. And this is all it means. I continue. Let's talk about the description of a godly wife's respect. She highly esteems him. All wives shall give to their husband's honor, both to great and small. It's Esther 120. Ponder the excellence of his person and value it properly. And if he is not accomplished, then she should consider the excellent of his, excellence of his place as the image and glory of God. 1 Corinthians 11, 7. You esteemed him when you chose him as your husband, and you should continue to do so. Remember McCall's disrespect to David and her punishment from God in 2 Samuel 6. Her family and neighbors will respect her about as much as she respects her husband, so when honoring him, she honors herself. Next, she dearly loves him. This respect is composed of love, which is also the wife's duty. Titus 2.4 Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel left parents, friends, and country entirely out of love for their husbands. A young woman named Clara Cerventa was married to Valdoara. His body was so riddled with disease that no one else would touch him. But she dressed his sores with all care and sold her attire and jewelry to maintain him. Finally, he died, and when comforters came to her, she told them she would, bear, she would buy him back again with the loss of her five children if she could. She could beget her husband's love no better way than by her reverence toward him. Next, she diligently pleases him. The word reverence, respect, Ephesians 5, 3, 3, is literally the word fear. She should maintain chaste conversation coupled with fear. For one without the other is inadequate. This fear is not servile, but a sincere desire to please and refusal to offend him. I will do my utmost to please him, though I do not fear his hand, but his frown. I would rather displease the whole world than my husband. Number two, the pattern of a godly wife's respect. He continues. First point, the church's respect for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Ephesians 5.22 Therefore, the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 524. Her submission is to be like the church's ideal submission to Christ. In everything, the text says, in things great and small, agreeable and disagreeable to her. Only when he requires what God forbids, or forbids what God requires, is she to refuse submission. She may reason with him in things inconvenient to her, but if he would not be persuaded, and there is no sin in the case, she must submit to him. Free, willing, and cheerful. The service Christians do to the Lord is with good will, Ephesians 6, 7. So the wife should submit to her husband as if there were but one will in their two hearts. The and Rachel follow Jacob like his shadow, Genesis 31, 16. Sarah's reverence was sincere as she called her husband Lord, in Genesis 18. And this is an example for Christian wives. 
and therefore a grudging obedience is unacceptable and usually springs from her unmortified pride and self-conceit. Even if he is severe, it is better for you to do your duty and leave his judgment to God. The body's respect for the head. For the husband is the head of the wife, Ephesians 5.23. All members of the body realize the head is useful for their good. The hand will accept a wound to protect the head. Whatever the head decides to do, the body gets up and follows as long as it can. This is the way the wife should honor her husband, second only to God. It is ludicrous for the head to go one way and the rib another, for a soldier to command his general, or for the moon to pretend superiority over the sun. Only the husband is insane is this altered. The man has authority in his house unless he is verbum anomalum, that is, a fool. Martin Luther. Section 3. The demonstration of a godly wife respect. First in word. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 12, 34. If she really respects him, it will show him what she says. And her tongue is a law of kindness. Proverbs 31, 26. She speaks respectfully of him in his absence. No wife is too great or good to imitate Sarah's godly example of giving her husband a title of respect like Lord. A wicked woman refers to her husband as the man, he says in this, for that this was the worst thing wives called them, their husbands behind their backs. Hmm. She speaks respectfully to him in his presence. Beware of interrupting him while he is speaking, or saying ten words to his one. Silence commends a woman's wisdom more than speech. A wise woman uses words sparingly. Of course, sometimes many words are necessary. And husband does need to learn to listen to his wife's manner of communication. Yet, talking over or interrupting, avoid. Also, beware of using disrespectful words of tone. Strive for a meek or quiet spirit. Do not be afraid that this will make your husband worse, but trust in God's wisdom. Remember, God hears and will judge you for every idle word, Matthew 12. Ideally, both the husband and wife should be slow to passion, slow to anger, slow to irritation. Yet where one must yield, it is most reasonably expected of the wife. No woman gets honor by having the last word. Some women argue that their tongue is their only weapon. But the wise know that their tongue is set on fire by hell, James 3.6. See how Rachel spoke rashly to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. As soon as she had two children, she did die in Genesis 35. On the other hand, Abigail behaved prudently with a very bad husband and was raised to honor. If respect will not prevail with him, anger never can. That is why the husband and wife ought to agree never to shout at one another. Indeed, that is in actions. She obeys his directions and restraints. Sarah obeyed Abraham, and she's a worthy model. 1 Peter 3.6 he said, quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. In Genesis 18. She did it promptly. The wife is bound and conscious to obey her husband in everything that is not contrary to the revealed will of God. And even in this case, she should refuse respectfully. For example, she cannot consent to omit Bible reading or prayer or sanctifying the Lord's Day, although he commanded ever so sternly. The house is her proper place. She is its beauty. There is business. There is her business and safety. Only urgent necessity should call her abroad. A prostitute's feet did not abide at her house. Proverbs 7 and 11. Just live for her, her husband judges best. Wives are to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. As in Titus 2 4. Good and obedient to their own husbands. She asks his counsel and hears his reproofs. Rebecca would not send Jacob to her brother Laban without consulting Isaac. Genesis 27. Sarah would not discard Hagar the servant, without consulting Abraham, Genesis 21. The Shunammite woman would not receive a prophet into the house without advising her husband, 2 Kings 4. Her hardest task is in hearing a reproof lovingly and thankfully, reproof and correction, to hear it lovingly and thankfully, especially if she has a proud and contentious spirit. But she should remember she has her faults, and no one can see them better than her husband. Yes, the opposite is true. But again, hear the word to you. She should remember she has her faults, and no one can see them better than her husband. So to answer him harshly for reproof shows great ingratitude. If she really respects him, this will be a much easier pill to swallow. 
She maintains a respectful and cheerful attitude at all times. He should not indulge irritability or gloom when he is happy, or be giddy when he's sad. She should try her best to make him delight in her. Let her express contentedness in her goods and position, and a sweet disposition, so he will enjoy being at home with her. Let her study how he likes his meals, his clothes, his lodging, and conform to his pleasure, because even in these small things, many sharp arguments may arise. She must never let her familiarity with him breed contempt. His love must not make her forget her duty, but rather increase her efforts. His fondness must not decrease her respect for him. It is better to obey a wise man than a fool. Most husbands are liable to reform their wives. Oh, I'm sorry. Most husbands are liable to reform if their wives respect them properly. Which, again, is an appeal back to 1 Peter 3. Some will disregard all this counsel with the excuse that none can attain it, but this mocks God. He will punish all such. If his vengeance does not meet you in this life, as it often does the rebellious, then it will in another. A true Christian is marked by a fundamental submission to biblical counsel. Without this, you're mere hypocrites. How to accomplish these duties? Keep yourself pure before marriage. Don't know if there's anyone in this group who are not married yet. But nearly everyone will be. And this is very good for you. This will help you in duties of marriage later. Everyone should possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. 1 Thessalonians 4. The fornicator before marriage continues his sin in marriage. Be aware of lusts first beginning and flee it like poison. Keep your heart filled with the things of God and your body busy about your duties. The greatest fires begin with a spark. Momentary pleasure that precedes eternal torment is utter folly. If you have sinned in this way, cleanse your hearts and hands with Christ's blood by confession to God, with fasting and prayer for his forgiveness and strength against future temptation. Get a taste of the more ravishing delights of God's favor and promises, pardon of sin, and assurance of life and immortality. Once you have drunk from the pure spring, you will not, you will not prefer the muddy stream. Choose your spouse carefully. Now that you know how difficult godly marriage is, you should be praying that God would guide you into it. Do not first love and then consider. First consider, and then love. Let their soul be your main concern, not their looks or money. Why espouse a perpetual cross for some passing profit or delight? Marry only a Christian, and the more godly the better. Consider also their personality. Speak honestly to one another about your faults and liabilities before marrying. If someone sold you a sick animal as a healthy one, you would feel cheated. How much worse is it when someone pretends to be better than they really are to secure marriage to the one they profess to love? Be honest. Study biblical marriage duties before you have them. Being a godly spouse is such a big challenge that you must prepare for it well beforehand. It's no wonder so many marriages fail. Too often the husband does not know how to rule. The wife does not know how to obey. They're both ignorant, conceited, miserable. Therefore, parents ought to teach their children about the duties of marriage. Otherwise, families which should be the nurseries of the church prove to be hotbeds of disorder and immorality. Read not only the scripture, but good books, like Googe's Treatise on Domestic Duties, William Googe, still in print these days, I might add. An excellent book to consider. Talks about Mr. Bolton, Mr. Gaddick, or Mr. Waitley. I'm not as familiar with those. But a modern book that is extremely helpful is one written by a certain Doug Wilson called Reforming Marriage published by Canon Press. Reforming Marriage. Recommend it. Next, resolve to obey God without any reservation. Until you are born again and made holy in your heart and conduct, you cannot please God or be a complete blessing to your spouse. You can only live together as civil pagans. A husband that truly fears God cannot remain bitter against his wife. It's true. A Bible place between you will eliminate many differences, comfort many distresses, and guide you in many confounding circumstances. Remember, God's commands have the highest reason, and so obedience has the greatest sweetness. Keep the golden rule in your marriage. Righteousness abroad will not excuse wickedness at home. When you each focus on your own duties, you will be blessed. Get and maintain true affection for your spouse. Give no place to jealousy. Do not give ear to backbiters and gossips. Jealousy often develops where true affection was lacking from the heart. Pray for spiritual graces. Wisdom. A lack of wisdom causes many troubles in marriage. We need much wisdom to rule as husbands and to submit as wives. Humility. This keeps the husband from becoming a, keeps the husband from becoming a tyrant and the wife in ready subjection to her husband. 
By pride comes contention. 13.10 Proverbs. A proud person cannot agree with an angel. The humble will agree with most anyone. Humility also will promote contentment. And the humble husband and wife will say, My spouse is far too good for such a sinful person as myself. I don't deserve such a wonderful partner. That was a sharp reproof. But it was nothing compared to hell, which is what I deserve. You see, truly humble people are easy companions. Uprightness. An upright heart is needed to keep these commandments of God. An upright heart will choose the safest course, even if it is the hardest course. It will suffer the worst injury rather than cause the least. It will watch against the beginnings of sin which produce marriage's worst troubles. The upright husband and wife will strive to do their own duty and will be most severe against their own failures, not those of their spouse. That was a lot to take in. Thankfully, if you wanted to listen to it again, you could rewind the video and play it. The recording is going to be brief. But in such ways, such important ways, your health can be built up. Learn the ways of God and trust them. Reject your sin. Reject selfishness and pride. Embrace humility. Encourage your husband. Your house will be built up. And don't fail in it. Lest you be tearing your own house down. So, all for now. Whoever is leaving the study after the video closes here in just a few seconds, do pray. It is my prayer that God would bless you all. And if you wanted to reach out to me, you certainly can. You can contact through cruciform, cruciformindy.com, I think is the website right now. Reach out to me, if you wanted to, at rincrast at gmail.com. R-I-N-C-R-A-S-T at gmail.com. If you'd like to leave a message or ask a question, happy to do what I can to answer it. And may God bless you.